Good evening. As a Butch noted, yes, uh, it is a total joke when I kid with Pastor Philip about the length of Hebrews. So thankful for Philip and Cheryl and their family, and I'm so grateful that they are now moved here. Amen? Praise the Lord that they are here. And uh, I asked him, were you able to get a nap this afternoon somewhere other than the office over there? And he was. And so uh, I'm grateful that the Lord has brought them to us. What a great blessing they are to uh, my life and to this congregation. Hebrews chapter 13 is where we are this evening. If you would turn there with me, please. Hebrews chapter 13. And um, we finish with verses 22 through 25. I will tell you uh, in advance, I do not anticipate this to be the normal sermon in terms of its length. I anticipate it to be rather brief tonight, but I've been surprised before, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. One of the things that comes to mind when I look at these final verses is I stand amazed at how the Lord has chosen to communicate his word to us. You know, he could have given us revelation, written revelation, in any way he wanted. He could have given us uh, revelation in ways not written, had he wanted to do that. But he chose to give to us a word that is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible, it is all-sufficient, and yet it is communicated to us through letters that bear all the marks of normal human communication. It's very interesting to me that this is not some bizarre kind of of form of written communication, something we would be altogether unfamiliar with, but rather the Lord chose to give us His Word by guiding these writers as they wrote in a way they would have written at any time. Um, That's why the opening of these New Testament letters are, they bear many of the same um, marks of any letter of their time. The closing of these letters look like any other letter of their time. And yet the Lord is guiding them so that what they were writing was His very Word. I think it's also important for us to recognize as they're writing this, they are communicating in the moment. They're concerned about what is right in front of them, the issues that they're dealing with, the people they're dealing with, the challenges they're facing. They're not thinking about the year 2016 as they write these letters. And yet, because the Lord is working through them to give us His Word, the Lord had 2016 in mind, even as they addressed the people they were addressing. I don't pretend to understand all of the reasons that God chose to give us His Word the way that He did, but one thing does stand out to me, and that is by doing it this way, we get a window into their lives at the time. We get some, some insight into how they related to each other. Believers in the first century and in these first churches, how they related to each other, how they communicated with each other, what they were concerned about with each other, what gripped their hearts as they thought about ministry. And so what we get to see is how the faith is lived out. Because he gave us his word in this way, we get to see how the, the word of God changes people and changes relationships. We get to see what really concerned these people. And in that way, we learn what should really concern us. And that's where my mind is tonight as I look at these final verses. I want, to, I want us to take note together of what concerned the writer as he closes this letter, and I want us to think about the fact that these same things must concern us. The things we'll look at tonight are simple. As I said, I expect they will be brief, but they are very important because you find in many cases people struggling in their walk with God, 
because these simple areas of concern are not priorities the way they should be in our lives. Three concerns we'll notice together this evening from these final verses. First of all, we will see that we must care about truth. We must care about the truth. Second, we're going to see that we must care about people. And third, we're going to see that we must care about spiritual realities. He cared about the truth. That's evident in his his closing words. He cares about people. That's evident in his closing words. And throughout these closing words, we see his concern about spiritual realities. First of all, notice his concern about the truth. Verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Bear with, he says, bear with my word of exhortation. When he says bear with it, he means that they would listen willingly, that they would embrace what he has written. You could say put up with it. You could say um, endure with it. In other words, he doesn't want them just to hear it and then turn away from it. He doesn't want this read and then forgotten. He's concerned that they would really take what he has written into their hearts. He's concerned that the truth is not lost on them, that the truth is embraced by them. The very way that he words this indicates that he's concerned they might not do that, that they might turn away from it, that they might not really take it into their hearts. And why would that be? Well, much of what he's written is complex. He acknowledges that in chapter 5, verse 11. He's, he's written to them of things that are hard to explain. And sometimes we don't really dig in with the things that are hard to understand. We don't really grapple with those things like we should. But another reason he might be concerned is because so much of this letter has been severe. I mean, he has had serious concerns that he has expressed with serious warnings. At least five warning passages in the book of Hebrews, each one strong. And so he has addressed them in a very strong way. He's addressed them in a very personal way. He's addressed them in a very focused and intentional way. And he knows human nature. He knows that sometimes that kind of address doesn't meet with acceptance. I find it telling that from time to time, someone will come up to me after a sermon and say something like this, "Um, was that aimed at me? (laughs) Sometimes they're kidding, sometimes they're not. What does that say to us? It It says that we live in a time, I'm not picking on anybody who's ever said that to me. I don't even remember who said that to me, okay? So I'm not picking on you if you've ever said that. But I do think it indicates that we live in a time when, when there's sort of this expectation that the preaching of God's Word should not have a personal element to it, that it shouldn't really be pointed at me, it, it shouldn't really be intentionally focused upon me. Speak to the room if you want to, speak to the walls and let me listen in, but don't get into my kitchen. Don't, don't bring God's Word to bear upon my life face to face. Don't come to me with the, with the Bible in a way that it's, it's confrontational to me. I find that interesting, especially when you read the New Testament letters, because you find they were, they were both personal and then they, were, they were intentionally focused. I mean, much of what we find in the New Testament, the, the readers, the listeners had to know, he's talking to me. I think, for example, about Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, where, I mean, Paul just outs these two ladies, Euodius and Syntyche, and he says, tell these two women to get, get along, to agree in the Lord. In fact, he asked someone to help them with that. I'll guarantee you they walked away going, that was aimed at me. <laughs> that was aimed right at me. You read Paul's letters to the Corinthians, I mean... 
Is he talking to us when he talks about the woman who's involved in an illicit relationship with his stepmother? He's talking to them. When he's talking about those who've been getting drunk at the Lord's table, those people are going to know who those people are. When he talks about people suing one another in the public court system, they're going to know who he's talking about. When he talks about someone standing up in the assembly and cursing Jesus in the name of the Holy Spirit, they will remember when that happened. When he talks about the violation of of a proper pattern and organization with respect to speaking in, in languages in the church, tongues, and then the interpretation of those tongues, they're going to remember instances when that was not followed So much of what we read in the Word of God is personal. It is intentional. It is focused. And he's concerned that they don't reject it, that they really receive it. We ought to be concerned about the same thing. We are not to come to the Bible and treat it as if it's speaking to us at arm's length. Every time we open the Bible, there's a bullseye on our backs. The little red laser beam is on our forehead. The Lord is speaking to me, and He is speaking to you. And that's how we need to hear the Word of God. And if we ever stop hearing it that way, we are beginning to listen to it like auditors of the Bible instead of doers of the Word. He's concerned about the fact that they get the truth, and we ought to be concerned about the same thing. By the way, in these words, he does identify the nature of the book of Hebrews, doesn't he? He calls it here, my word of exhortation. So even though this is full of warnings and and all the rest, this is not a word of condemnation. This is a word of exhortation. This is meant to spur them on in their walk with Jesus. This is meant to move them forward in a right pathway And when you look for this exact phrase somewhere else in the New Testament, word of exhortation, you only find it one other place in the New Testament. You find it in the book of Acts where Paul and Barnabas were invited to give a word of exhortation in a synagogue service. So this could be sort of a technical way to speak of a sermon. Once again, reminding us that this letter bears the marks of a sermon. Listen to this word of exhortation, he's saying. He also identifies the importance of the letter. I've already mentioned this by by encouraging them to bear with it. It's important that you really hear it. I don't want you just exposed to these truths. I want you moved by these things and changed by these things. He also identifies the limitation of the letter because he says at the end of verse 22, I have written to you briefly. There's much more I could say. There's much more I want to say. But for the sake of brevity, I have have said it as I have. Now, embrace it. If you think about what a weighty letter this already is, and then you understand he could have said much more, how great his concern must have been for them. So, first thing we ought to be concerned about as God's people is the truth that we receive the truth and that we communicate the truth and that others receive the truth. Second area of concern we see in his closing words is a concern about people. Verse 23, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. This is the second sort of window into into their world, into their lives, into how the truth was operating in their midst. Just like in our day, the truth needs to go down into hearts and be grasped there. He's concerned about that. But, But at the same time, he speaks here of personal relationships. His relationship with them is not a distant one. They, he loves these people. They love him and know him. And together they love a man like Timothy. And I think we're right to assume that the Timothy being referred to here in verse 23 is the same Timothy who was Paul's associate. Because all he has to say in verse 23 is our brother Timothy, and they know who he's talking about. And it appears in verse 23 that Timothy has been imprisoned 
We don't know anything more about the imprisonment than what he says here, but Timothy has been imprisoned and now he's been released. And the writer anticipates a reunion with Timothy. This speaks, by the way, of Timothy's ongoing influence in the life of the churches. And with this writer and with these particular readers. And so he anticipates a, a reunion with Timothy and then that they would have a reunion with Timothy and with himself. He said, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. And so there may be an indication there, if he doesn't come soon, I'll come by myself. But, but what I hope will be true is that he will come soon and that he and I will come together and spend time with you. And then he goes on to send larger greetings. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. That, that indicates that this letter must have been addressed to a group within the church. Jewish believers, Hebrew believers, because he asks these people reading the letter to greet their leaders and the saints at large. And he indicates that those who come from Italy send their greetings. Now, this really doesn't settle the issue of, of where these people lived because it could mean that there are people with him from Italy. He's somewhere else outside of Italy, and they send their greetings, in which case the readers would live in Italy. He's somewhere else with people from Italy, and he's sending greetings to those who now live in Italy. Or it could indicate that, that he's in Italy with these people, and these people receiving the letter live somewhere else, outside of Italy. So it doesn't settle that issue. But what you do see is a concern about relationships with respect to an individual, Timothy, and then a larger set of relationships that, that are enjoyed by virtue of their common faith. And we ought to be concerned about people in, in both those realms. We love each other in a particular way. We, we ought to get to know each other and care about each other and be concerned about each other in an individual sort of way. But then also we, we ought to know what it is to enjoy a relationship of love in the family of God that exists there because of our common faith. We're going to hear about congregations that we've never met with personally somewhere else in the world. We, we're going to have opportunity to support congregations somewhere else in the world that we never get to meet with personally, and yet there's a kinship and a and a unity based upon our common faith. You heard this morning about churches that we support in Baltimore and in Boston, and we're sending out a young missionary couple today to go and, and translate the Word of God, and we hear about seminaries that we support in various places in the world, and, and all of that should matter to us. That's why we give a report like, we gave, like David gave this morning, because it should matter to us, even though we've never met many of these people. But we know that there are workers along with ourselves on behalf of, of our Savior, on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of our God. And, and then we think about people that have ministered to us, that have, have made an investment in this congregation, and we care about how they're doing. Men like Tom Schreiner and Bruce Ware and and, and men who have come to become great friends of this congregation. We, we, we wonder, where are they at this week? Where are they serving at this weekend? Where are they sharing the Word of God? We ought to be concerned about those sort of things and pray for people like this. This is the love we, we share in the family of God. So concerned about the truth, caring about people both on a personal level and we could say, I guess, an ecclesiastical level, just loving the church as the church. And I would just add that the first concern always dictates and guides the second. Our love for people is informed by the Word of God, guided by the Word of God. Third, we must care about spiritual realities. Now, I noted that God has chosen to communicate His Word to us through normal human communication. These letters just look like letters of their time. But in, in one way, these letters are, along with the fact they're inspired, just I'm talking now about their form and their content, altogether different than the letters of their time. And that is, these letters are filled with spiritual vision. The 
truth of God is here. The greetings, the benedictions, the doxologies say that their perspective is the perspective that has been taught to them by salvation. Here is a man who sees spiritual realities. Here's a man who desperately cares about those realities. He sees the reality of salvation. He notes in verse 24, greet all your leaders. What what a unique way now to describe the people of God. And all the saints, all the saints, people who have been taken out of the world of unbelief, and brought into the family of God. And in that way, they've been set apart unto the living God. They are God's people, holy ones, set apart unto the Lord, dedicated unto God, belonging to God. That's who you are, church. You're the saints of God. And that's a perspective that is taught by salvation. That's a spiritual reality. He sees the reality of regeneration and adoption. Because notice, he he says, I appeal to you, brothers. He's writing to brothers, brethren. And when he talks about Timothy, verse 23, he speaks of him as our brother, Timothy. Our brother. Is that just a word to us? Or is that a reality to us? Does it really sink into our minds and hearts that we are spiritually one in Jesus Christ. This is not a brotherhood like the Kiwanis Club or something. This is not the brotherhood sort of language you would find at a job. Hey, brother. this, This speaks of the fact that we are the children of God and we've been adopted into the same family and we've experienced regeneration. We share a new nature In Jesus Christ, spiritual life is present in us. The seed of God is present in us. The Spirit of God dwells in us. The reality of justification, the saints of God, the reality of regeneration and adoption. We are brethren. He also sees the reality of spiritual authority. It's striking, isn't it? That once again, he speaks of their leaders. This is the third time in chapter 13. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Why do you make that distinction? I, would, I will just say again, I think there's some indication they were struggling with their attitude toward leaders. And so once again, he wants to drive home the fact of the reality of spiritual authority and structure in the Lord's church. The only reason and the only way we'll ever see those things is because we believe the Word of God. We believe that the church is God's, that Christ is the chief shepherd and the head of the church, and that He has mediated His rule in such a way that there is a leadership structure in His church. We we believe this because He's revealed this. It's a spiritual reality that we have to grasp with spiritual vision. So we see the reality of justification, the reality of adoption, regeneration. We see the reality of spiritual authority. And then he closes with a fourth reality, and that's the reality of spiritual presence and favor. He ends by saying, grace be with all of you. Those aren't just words, are they? That's a real prayer. May the grace of God be with all of you. This is what you need, and this is, this is the perspective of wise spiritual leaders. They understand their role, their task, their limitation. At the end of the day, you are always entrusted to God and His grace and His word. You are a blood-bought people belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the elders of this church, for example, the, the only thing we do is carry out a role that's been assigned to us 
But Jesus is the chief shepherd, and so you are always in our minds, in our hearts, being entrusted to God and to His grace and to His Word. If we think in any other way, then we don't see things as they really are. Spiritual reality. These three areas of concern must be ours. Concerned about the truth. Concerned about people. Concerned about what we know to be real spiritually. Because the Lord has revealed it in His Word And so I will finish tonight where he finishes and ask you, do you care about these things? Is the cause of truth your cause? If the cause of truth is your cause, it's going to begin to be your cause first in your own life. And then in the life of your family. And in all of your friendships. And in the life of the church. Are the people of God your people? We talked about it briefly this morning. All the racial tension that we're seeing on display in in our world. Who are my people? My people are the people of God. They are my people. And who are the other people? They are my mission field. They are men and women who need to be reconciled to God through the message of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, these are the spiritual realities. This world will never see spiritual reality apart from salvation. And so that's my view. Are the people of God your people? And are the realities of the gospel real in your sight? Salvation, is that a real thing? Regeneration, adoption, is that real? Are are you really brethren? Spiritual authority, is that real? God's presence, God's power, God powerfully working in us that which is pleasing in His own sight. God producing in us, equipping us with every good thing so that we can do His will Is that a real need that we have so that we get on our knees and we pray for these things? Thank God these things are real. My prayer for you and my prayer for me is that they would be increasingly real in our own sight. That our hearts would be convinced. You know, we sing about that sometimes. Lord, help me to believe these things. Strengthen us to see and to grasp and to believe these things. That you, the living God, you've revealed to be true. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus. We thank you for his shed blood that has ratified and finalized the new covenant and And brought it into being. Lord, we thank you that his blood answers for all of our sins. And his righteousness is our plea before you. And that you have given us the forgiveness of our sins and the righteousness of your son. And communicated it to us by faith. And we thank you that everything we've received in him is enough. So I pray that we would not be a people blown around by every wind of doctrine, moved away from the truth of the gospel, but we would be a people stable in these things that you've revealed. And I pray, Lord, that the very things that grip the heart of the writer of Hebrews would grip our hearts, the things that concerned him, this man of God whom you used to give us your word, These things would grip our hearts, Lord, a concern for truth, a concern for people, and an ability, a willingness, a desire to see all of life through the lens of of the realities, the spiritual realities that you've told us about on the pages of your word. 
Lord, I pray that you would grow us up, mature us in our faith in your Son, and use us to evangelize our world in these days. Lord, I pray specifically and especially for Vacation Bible School this week. And pray that as your word goes forth through the teachers and the leaders with so many children you'll entrust to us, God, would you work powerfully through that. And I pray especially also for Thursday night when parents will be listening to the gospel. And I pray the result would be that you would bring men and women to faith in your son. Lord, would you bring into being families that believe where before there were families that didn't. Lord, would you, would you move powerfully this week and make us mindful all around us of those who need your son and give us the boldness that we need to be what we are, your witnesses in this world. May you seal what we've seen today to our hearts. Let us think about these things as we go home and live in the light of them. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.